This is Pastor Randy. Thanks for joining me for today's message, which looks at the nails on Calvary. It's part of our Gifts of Calvary series. This is the third message in that series. And today's scriptures are from John chapter 19, verses 17 to 18, 28 to 30, and from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. Reading from John chapter 19, verse 17. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14, Paul writes, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Max Lucado's book, He Chose the Nails, gave me the inspiration for this sermon series. He looks at the various elements surrounding the last days of Jesus and contemplates the meaning behind them. In the first week, we talked about the abusive behavior of the soldiers, the way they mocked Jesus and spat upon him and heaped abuse upon him, even when they didn't have to. They weren't ordered to. They just had a mean streak in them, a bent toward evil, toward sin. We have those tendencies too. Jesus carried them to the cross. Even at our worst, he gave us his best. Last week, we talked about the crown of thorns he wore, and I pointed out that in the parable of the sower, Jesus said thorns were the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth that choke out God's word in our life. Jesus wore that crown of thorns to Calvary and bore our worries and our misplaced priorities with him as well. Today, we're going to look at the nails that were used to crucify him. Early in my years at Cumberland, one of our members gave me three huge nails, almost a foot long each. He thought I might find them useful in a sermon at Easter time sometime, but I never used them until now. They've been on the shelf behind my desk this whole time, but as I thought about the nails of Calvary, I thought of those nails on my shelf. The Bible doesn't actually say, by the way, that there were three nails. That detail was added by us after learning about the methods used in crucifixion, even from archaeological discoveries of crucified victims, we were able to discern that they probably used three nails. Two nails would be driven, one through each wrist, not in the palms of the hands that some people have imagined. And a third was driven through both feet as they were arranged one on top of the other. You might have heard someone say, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus on the cross, but his love for you and me. And that's the point I want to emphasize today the gift of Calvary, the love that we see there. Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. He could have escaped at the back of the olive grove that we call Gethsemane and disappeared into the wilderness never to be heard from again. It must have been tempting. You can sense the agony in his prayer in Gethsemane. Father, he says, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. And nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was not naive about what was coming. Like everyone else who had ever visited Jerusalem, he would have seen the pathetic victims of Roman crucifixion lining the roads into town. They placed them in high traffic areas so that everyone could see. This is what happens to those who are not friends of Rome. It was considered the worst way to die and reserved only for the worst criminals. It was this fact that caused so many Jews to be unable to believe in Jesus after that first Easter. Cursed is anyone who dies on a tree, it's said in the scripture, and that's what the common understanding was. Jesus knew this, but when it came, became clear that this was the way God planned to redeem humankind, to show the depth of his love and mercy, he chose to love and not leave. He chose the nails. 
C.S. Lewis is also a poet. You might know him as a famous Christian writer, but he also was a poet, and one of his poems was called Loves as Warm as Tears. And the last stanza of that poem says, Loves as hard as nails. Love is nails. Blunt, thick, hammered through the medial nerves of one who, having made us, knew the thing he had done and seen what, with all that is, our cross in his. He knew what he'd done, seeing with all that is our cross in his. Jesus knew the price he would pay on Calvary. He had told his disciples when they were in the northern region of Caesarea Philippi, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and after three days rise again. That's from Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And then on his way to Jerusalem, in the Gospel of Mark reports that he told them, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, the Romans, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Mark chapter 10, verses 33 to 34. Jesus was not an unknowing victim. He counted the cost of what love would demand, and he chose the nails. That cost is implied by the account of his crucifixion that we find in John chapter 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The words, it is finished, are actually a translation of a single Aramaic word, which was used as a stamp on a certificate of debt when the final payment had been made. Basically, it means paid in full. Paul used this imagery when he talked about how the wages of sin are death and that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have failed to do the things we should. We have wrongly done things we shouldn't do. And each offense is like an IOU, a debt that we have incurred, a debt we could never repay. Vicki and I have taken out a number of loans during our lifetime for a house, cars, even to be able to buy out my retirement from the public school system. And I can tell you that every person, like every other person who's ever paid off a loan, will tell you, and that is that making that last payment is a joyful occasion. We had one of those here at Cumberland not long after I came. We finished paying off the loan on the annex portion of the building and had a loan burning ceremony out back to celebrate. It is finished. Those are wonderful words. In the ancient word, a world, when a law was canceled, it was placed on a board and a nail was driven through it to symbolize it being canceled. This is probably the background for the picture that Paul paints in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14, when he says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, and he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. The word translated to say the charge was canceled literally means that it was wiped out like it never happened. In Bible times, documents were written either on papyrus or vellum. Papyrus was made from bulrushes, and I've seen it made in Egypt as they, they lay them perpendicular to each other in layers, and they pound it until they can, can get the uh, juices out and, and make it into a paper-like substance. It's not easy to do. And vellum was an animal skin. Both of these were expensive and not readily available for writing, so they wouldn't be wasted. And ink in those days didn't have any acid in it, so it just laid on top of the paper, and it could be wiped off with a damp sponge so that it was like it was never there. And that's what God did with our list of sins. He loved us so much that he literally wiped the slate clean. Max Locato imagines that the list of our indebtedness was under Jesus' hands and blotted out by the blood that flowed from his wrists. William Barclay proposes that the law and our inability to save ourselves by keeping it was nailed to the cross. He says, but now law is banished and grace has come. Man is no longer a criminal who has broken the law and is at the mercy of God's judgment. He is the son who was lost and can now come home to be covered by the grace of God. 
Nicholas Zinzendorf was a prominent 18th century Protestant leader, and he wrote, for all at once, all sin is atoned for on the cross. The entire fall is erased, and the whole obligation to Satan and the entire sentence passed upon the fall of Adam is torn up, canceled, and annulled by the nails of Jesus. I know that the metaphor of Jesus paying a debt we could not pay doesn't entirely explain the work he accomplished on Calvary. Somehow his sacrifice made us right with God, and the theological word for that is atonement. And the New Testament tries to explain it by, through the writers using a number of different word pictures. But the fact is, the only fact that really matters is that it was love that brought Jesus to Jerusalem. And it was love that caused him to put our needs above his own, to stay and subject himself to a mockery of a trial, to being spat upon and tortured in a criminal's death. It was to show us the depth of our need and the vastness of his love that led him to Calvary. And I know that because of that love, he chose the nails. He chose them. It was not an accident. Jesus was not an unwilling victim. It was a choice, a gift of Calvary, to say to you, I love you this much. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of the grace you've showed us at Calvary. We've done things we should not have done, and we've left undone things which we should have done. We know that we all owed a debt that we could not pay, could never pay. And yet you and your mercy offered us grace rather than judgment and forgiveness rather than condemnation. Help us receive the gift you offered on Calvary and by your spirit live a life that honors you in everything we say and do. For it's in Jesus' name and for his glory that we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.